welcome to our panel today. We're very excited. It's part of our Graduate Academy for the Pilecki Institute. We have an absolutely amazing stellar historians lined up for today's panel about 1956, de-Stalinization before and after. So I'm going to start with our first introduction, and that is Professor Sergei Ranchenko, who's a professor at the Kissinger Center for Global Affairs, the School of Advanced International Studies, John Hopkins University. And he has published many books on the Soviet-China relations during the Cold War period. Dr. Zuzanna Varga's main field re of research is the history of socialist agriculture in Hungary. She's published extensively on the subject and is currently the head of modern Hungarian history department at, please do forgive me for pronouncing the university incorrectly, um, Edvest Lorand University in Budapest. Mm -hmm. And our moderator slash participant today is uh, Dr. Bartłomiej Kapica, who is a historian and assistant professor at the Pilecki Institute. He specializes in Polish history during the communist period, more specifically, the history of the party apparatus. In the near future, his book will be published uh, about Władysław uh, Bienkowski, which we're all awaiting very eagerly. So thank you so much for joining us. Like I said, please don't forget, put your questions in the Q&A box and um, we'll have about 45 minutes and then we'll get to some questions. And uh, I invite Dr. Bartłomiej Kapita to take the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Alina, for that uh, very kind and nice introduction. I'm delighted for being a moderator and participant of our panel. Uh, and I think that the topic that we are going to cover uh, today uh, is, I would say, very important to understand how the Cold War evolved and uh, what was the reason behind that evolution. Uh, I think that uh, it should be mentioned that 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 this that this evolution uh, was derived from two major factors. The the first of them uh, was external and it was linked with international relations, um, not only connected with the countries that belong to the one of the rival blocs uh, during the Cold War, uh, but also uh, within those blocs. And secondly. We cannot neg neglect the fact that the evolution uh, was not only caused by the high level politics, but it also was connected with the internal uh, changes that occurred behind the eastern side, eastern side of the Iron Curtain. And, and I think that uh, we should start our conversation uh, by uh, the beginning uh, from the from the point that from which all all those changes all all those uh, all those evolutions um, come to the world uh, so basically the fall the fall that uh, started uh, first of all in the Soviet Union and then uh, it was also spread uh, in the Soviet satellites uh, in the eastern and in central. Europe. Uh, so basically speaking, uh, I think we should concentrate how it looked uh, in the USSR, in Hungary, and in Poland. Uh, maybe we will start from uh, the Soviet Union, which was the center of the of the empire, and and then we will move on to the. Uh, to the um, Poland and Hungary. Uh, Professor Rodchenko, please uh, tell us something about how the fall st started in the Soviet Union. Uh, thank you very much, Bartolome. Uh, regarding you know uh, the how it started, I, I guess the I guess the starting point for for what happened in 1956 was really the death of Stalin itself. Death of Stalin uh, in March 1953 was the event that began this process towards gradual relaxation in the Soviet Union. Some political prisoners were released. Uh, economic programs were changed in order to benefit consumers a little bit more than just the heavy industry. But that was not seen as enough by um, uh, the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev, who succeeded Stalin, not immediately, but certainly by 1956, he, he had more or less consolidated his control. He wanted to go against Stalin 
Um, and that's why he, for weeks, he had been preparing this speech in great secrecy. It, it, very few people knew about it. Of course, top Soviet leadership knew that there would be speech at the 20th Party Congress. Nevertheless, the country certainly did not know. Nobody overseas knew about it. It was a big secret. Comes the 20th Congress of the Communist Party in February 1956. Khrushchev suddenly makes the speech. Uh, it, that goes for hours in the dead of the night, and and you know all these people were present there. You could you could literally, as Khrushchev was speaking, there was complete silence. People were just shocked and horrified to hear about all those crimes that Stalin perpetrated, that he had uh, executed innocent people, that he had. Uh, uh, purged and exiled whole nations, that he um, was responsible of gross misconduct of the war against Germany, and so on and so forth, on and on goes, the so-called secret speech against Stalin. That was the uh, the big shock, as it were, of all uh, that, that then prompted that move towards uh, considerable unrest in the international communist movement. How did this happen? In fact, most, most of foreign uh, leaders of foreign communist parties who were in Moscow for the 20th Congress were not briefed about it. Only some Soviet allies, very close Soviet allies, were told about it, uh, sometimes not even given copies of the speech. Uh, so, for example, the Chinese learned about it. Uh, and then inside the Soviet Union, uh, the speech was still not published openly, but it was read out or bits and pieces of it were read out at closed party meetings, but the word went out. So people, more and more people knew about it. And of course, then, interestingly, through Poland, a copy of the secret speech leaked to the West and it was published by the New York Times by the summer of 1956. So that was the big shock for a lot of people. I mean, it was already a lot of people were you know, members of communist parties worldwide knew that something was happening. But uh, then of course came the big shock of the actual publication of the speech. So the whole world could see that, the, that Stalin, the demigod who all these communists around the world worship turned out to be an a criminal, a, a, a someone quite, you know, horrible personality responsible for all this death and all these crimes. Uh, so that was uh, an earthquake, an earthquake for the communist movement. Uh, and of course, it had a deep impact inside the USSR and beyond its borders. Now, I'll briefly, before I uh, pass on to Dr. Varga, I just wanted to mention inside the USSR, uh, the effects were, of course, far reaching. I wouldn't say that everyone supported the speech. Uh, sometimes you hear this narrative though here was destalinization, people were freed up, everyone was so happy. But but it, it interestingly the speech created um, uh, dissatisfaction among many people who thought that Khrushchev was blaming everything on Stalin and refusing to take on this, you know, take responsibility for the mistakes that he had also committed. For example, others would say, well, if, if Stalin was so horrible, then how did you tolerate him for all, all those years? It must be that Khrushchev and must be, you know, that Molotov and all those other leaders of the uh, Soviet Communist Party were also responsible. So they must be just shoving the blame onto Stalin in order to save themselves. So there was actually, you know, people were writing letters of protest in Georgia, for example, there were demonstrations not against Stalin, but for Stalin. There were protests in Georgia um, on the occasion of, uh, of destalinization. There, you know, uh, I, I found while I was working in the Chinese archives, which have since, since closed, one interesting thing I found in the archives were letters from Soviet communists who were writing to Mao Zedong complaining about how Khrushchev was uh, criticizing Stalin. So this is one part of the story. The the other part of the story is, of course, a sizable part of the, uh, of, of the population felt relieved and felt also angered that they had lived under this horrible system. Um, uh, uh, monuments to Stalin were being torn down. You know, people would go out in some places and chop chop off um, uh, the head to Stalin's monuments or tear down his portraits and so on and so forth. So the society was split in its perception of destalinization. But one thing that has to be said is that, of course, there was a moment of uh, it's like a sense of liberation, of, of, of some kind of freedom. You could breathe more openly now that Khrushchev 
took this daring action to speak out against Stalin. There's a big question of why he decided to do, to do that. Was that for ethical, moral reasons? Did he feel that Stalin had truly committed horrible crimes? Of course he did, and that therefore he had to be taken down. Uh, or was it for reasons that had to do with maybe political maneuvering inside the Soviet Communist Party where he wanted to uh, assert his legitimacy against other of, of, of Stalin's heirs? Uh, so both actually, both explanations have a right to uh, existence. Uh, both are viable, perhaps it was for both reasons. Uh, but um, uh, but in any case, uh, the 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 speech, the secret speech, uh, opened the page for de-Stalinization. That is considerable relaxation of uh, state control in the Soviet Union, but never real. It never really went all that far. But you know, it was a considerable relaxation compared to what uh, was before. That's why it was called the period of the thaw of the thaw, like you have in the depth of winter, you have a thaw, but then of course, after that, an, a new period of winter may come as it did in the 1960s. Um, the key point to remember about de-Stalinization is that Khrushchev attacked Stalin and assigned horrible crimes, rightly so, assigned uh, all kinds of horrible crimes to Stalin, but he did not attack the system itself. Somehow Khrushchev believed that you could all just take Stalin down, remove him from this equation, restore so-called socialist justice uh, into the system uh, and uh, you know uh, and then everything will be fine the system itself was just perfectly uh, honest and reasonable the system that was created by Lenin could go on and prosper just without Stalin as we know in retrospect this was a big mistake on the part of Khrushchev uh, even to think that way and in many ways even though Stalin was overthrown Stalinism never was in the USSR and it continued in various forms it, it still had, um, it, it survived through all these years and decades. And you could argue that even today, there's something of that system that still remains, some kind of legacies that still grip the Russian society. So in this way, you know, Russia uh, as the Soviet Union were never fully destalinized. And I'll stop here, thanks. Thank you very much. There's, there's something, uh, I think, very, very important to be to be underlined that the Soviet system, uh, which was installed, uh, or basically communist uh, system that was installed in the in Eastern Central Europe after the Second World War, was basically uh, meant to be an imitation of the Soviet system. Therefore, all the changes, all the all the evolutions uh, that took place in the satellite states like Poland and Hungary. Uh, were meant to be, uh, I would say, um, started or ignited uh, by the by the Soviet center. So, so, um, so the process that you that you describe it uh, also uh, started uh, in Poland and 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 in Hungary. Uh, could you tell us something more about it, uh, Doctor Doctor Varga? How it looked in in Hungary? Uh, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Dr. Kapica. And, uh, and you mentioned a very important uh, uh, point, or you raised the important point that uh, uh, during the Sovietization from the late 40s, uh, all these uh, uh, countries in the Central Eastern region had to copy uh, the, the Soviet, let's say, the Stalinist model in, in economy political life uh, and in society. And I think uh, that after the death of Stalin, uh, when these new course policies were implemented and, and started, um, these uh, policies, however, uh, were initiated uh, by the Moscow leadership, but during the implementation, uh, a certain divergency could be uh, examined, could be detected, and that's a, that's a crucial difference. Because, uh, um, for example, the the overall recipe what they offered to uh, to ease the tensions and the frustration of the working class and uh, so almost the uh, civil war at the countryside because of the collectivization. And uh, and so on. 
So they offer the same recipe, namely that the uh, economic policy should be shifted, uh, as uh, Professor Rachenko mentioned, from the heavy industry investments to, to the agriculture policy, more investment to agriculture, more investment to light industry, so just to fulfill the consumer needs. But uh, the question how it uh, could be realized uh, uh, was more depending on the local uh, leadership uh, um, uh, strategy. And uh, for example, in Hungary, when the new prime minister Imre Nagy was an agricultural specialist, he put uh, lots of emphasis into agriculture and he had his own vision how uh, the uh, relaxation uh, toward agriculture policy should be uh, put into practice. And for example, he uh, collected a specialist into a, a special committee uh, which, uh, which, uh, to which uh, he invited not only party members, but such professionals, for example, who, um, who were previously dismissed. So uh, 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 agriculture skills, I mean, um, uh, special expertise, uh, he rehabilitated uh, uh, and put first place and not only the party loyalty was important, but also that the professional knowledge, wisdom. And, and uh, uh, for example, the Hungarian new cost policy, I think went further than the Soviets wanted. And uh, it created uh, problems. And so a certain diver di uh, divergence appeared uh, within the bloc, which also I think weakened uh, this coherence uh, which they uh, wanted to establish uh, uh, from the late 40s. There is also, uh, oh, I think, one factor that uh, that uh, made Poland in one, let's say, in one way, uh, topping that Soviet model, but. But on the other hand, uh, it was um, very specific to Poland. It was the case of the Polish uh, pre-war communists from the uh, Polish Communist Party. And that was, uh, I think, um, very crucial to understand the division and the friction be between the uh, communist elites uh, in, in uh, Poland after uh, the Khrushchev's uh, uh, speech, because, because um, in some way, most of the elites of the Communist Party in Poland, uh, they were coming from the Communist Party, uh, from the Communist Party that existed before the war, and they wanted to basically to receive some answers. What was the fate of the Polish communists that were, as we know now, uh, um, basically murdered by by the Stalin's order, and that caused some sort of friction between the elites and also uh, what was meant to be a road uh, for the future. How would the, uh, the policy of the, of the Communist Party in Poland look like uh, uh, in the next few months? And I think that was that some sort of specific, uh, specific uh, Polish element uh, in the early phase of the uh, of the fall and and it also had something to do uh, how to deal with society because um, that was another problem that if we uh, try to lose control uh, and um, lighten the regime uh, that is supervising the society then we must find some way in which uh, from um, that we might, that we can govern this society but but uh, meanwhile we have to uh, make society more uh, let's say adopted to the communist way of rule and i think that it raises raises the question uh, to what extent 
extent the, the changes that, that occurred uh, were intended by the Communist Party. Because from the beginning, we can see that uh, there was a certain degree and let's say um, agreement that some changes are needed, but to what extent? And so, mm, so there is this question, uh, mm, which changes were intended by the Communist Party in Poland, USSR and Hungary, and which changes uh, were basically uh, an, if, an effect of, uh, let's say, historical process. Uh, Dr. Rodchenko, please. Well, thank you. I mean, I, many of the things that happened in the fall of 1956 were obviously unintended consequences of the uh, secret speech by Khrushchev. Never did he imagine that something like this would happen. Um, uh, you know, Poland and Hungary are the big stories, the big stories. We know about them, we talk about them because they entailed massive Soviet, well, non-intervention in case of Poland, but a massive intervention in case of Hungary. But the broader communist movement just was absolutely in chaos. Um, I was, um, you know, reading reports from uh, uh, Soviet embassies around, like in Western Europe, and they had, um, you know, the Soviet uh, diplomats had uh, as a part of their job had the responsibility of meeting with local communists just the stories that they send back to moscow are so um uh, you know remarkable in themselves with with people being in genuine shock how could you do this to us you know we believed in you we believed in this person you know we, we almost worshipped you and it turned out that it was all you know such a horrible thing uh, and of course, uh, communist parties around uh, around the world, uh, as a result, fractured. So um, in many cases, you had membership declined, collapse. This was the case, for example, with Communist Party of the United States that, well, it was never really a powerful force, but certainly after 1956, it was uh, uh, it, it just uh, declined into insignificance. The same thing happened in Western Europe, Danish Communist Party, Norwegian Communist Party, UK Communist Party, there was such a thing. Uh, uh, you know, you can see how they were affected by 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 this uh, changes coming from the Soviet Union, none of which were expected, none of which were intended by the Soviet leaders. And of course, when these things happened, uh, the Chinese from their perch were saying, why, we, you go, well, how did you not consult with us? We would have told you Stalin was a great sword. Now you're discarding this sword and our enemies will take it and kill us. Uh, Stalin was a rock and you're raising this rock to drop it on your feet. This is, you know, those are quotes from Mao Zedong, as it were. So the Chinese position themselves as, as, as insane. Well, you should have not done that because you're undermining the unity of the communist uh, communist movement. To a certain extent, this is probably correct. Um, and, and of course, this is sometimes seen, 1956 is also seen as the uh, starting point of, of the Sino-Soviet split, which completely destroyed the communist movement by the 1960s. So was that intended? Of course, all of that was unintended by Khrushchev. I think what he was thinking was more along the lines of let's you know maybe in some ways he was an idealist he thought let's try to um uh, let's try to take to uh, clean the air, open the windows a little bit, let fresh air come in, and, and, and then people will see what a glorious system they live under, that they're so happy to live under socialism, and, you know, we're building communism, everything is fine, yes, Stalin committed horrible mistakes, but now he's out of the way, everyone, everything will be fine hereafter, Nothing like that happened, obviously. So Khrushchev, uh, Khrushchev did, a, you know, he, he, we have to give him credit. He, he made a daring step. Who else would have done that? Who else could have done this kind of thing? Uh, but uh, the uh, consequences of this step was that communism as an idea basically was massively discredited by certainly by maybe to a lesser extent by 1950, by, by the secret speech and to much greater extent, I think, by the Soviet intervention in Hungary, which really just highlighted that if you want to build communism, you have to have Soviet tanks. If you don't have Soviet tanks, people don't want it. So that's the end of the story. And that, I think, was the beginning of the end of the communist project. <laughs> Yes, I, indeed, I totally, I totally agree with you. And for example, uh, the Hungarian Revolution was was also uh, um, basically uh, it was not meant to 
to be to to be happened uh, by the crucial speech. It was um, let's say uh, un, uh, let's say unwanted result of the of the fall. And Dr. Varda, how did it happen that that uh, that be because of the speech of uh, one person uh, that was given uh, during the secret meeting uh, after several months, uh, people uh, were fighting on the streets with the Soviet tanks and the Communist Party of Hungary, uh, its leadership declared that, that the Hungary is leaving the Warsaw Pact. Uh, it, how mm. did it happen? Uh, I could um, I could recall uh, the Politburo meetings from the summer of 1956 of the Hungarian uh, Workers' Party, and uh, they were full of problems, and uh, and they realized how deep is already the crisis. And if you if you studied the the local reports of the uh, secret police. Uh, they uh, provided the same information, so the uh, the uh, socialist system was really in a deep crisis already uh, before the outbreak of 1956. And uh, if you go back uh, 40, uh, 54 or 53, the same uh, problems uh, are on the agenda. So uh, I. I could, uh, of course, the importance of the Khrushchev speech is uh, is uh, out of question. But uh, if we take into account uh, also the uh, uh, the experience of everyday uh, people and this uh, what was happening uh, at the, at local level, then uh, we could see a, a slowly accumulating crisis which uh, uh, in the year of 1956 um, um, uh, led to, to two uh, extreme um, um, events, one in Poland, the, uh, the uprising of uh, workers in Poznan and this uh, Hungarian revolution. And I think uh, it needs, uh, it needs a, a broader explanation uh, why in the Hungarian revolution uh, all groups of the Hungarian society took part, even including the party members. So uh, I think uh, it, it is uh, really interesting to also uh, discuss a little bit more uh, what was going on in these societies uh, since uh, 53. Exactly. And and I think that uh, there is one element uh, in Poland uh, that uh, previously uh, was some sort of a glue uh, during the Stalinist times. It was fear. And after the Khrushchev speech, after, after the amnestia, which uh, came into life in Poland uh, in spring 1956, the the fear, the fear of Bespieka, the fear of Communist Party, it was step by step disappearing. And, and when the workers in Poznan, uh, they tried to go on strike against the rising uh, prices, against the uh, low, lowering wages, uh, the fear that was used by the Communist Party in previously years, as a tool uh, to, to subdue this, the society, that fear was already gone. And, and I think that this is a very important um, sociological factor that, uh, that can explain why uh, some events uh, were possible in 1956 and they weren't a uh, few years ago. And, and another factor um, which is also connected with the fear and and let's say a hope that was rising uh, during that time was that people uh, felt free to express themselves. For example, uh, in August 1956, uh, uh, there was a massive uh, mass in Częstochowa in Jasnogóra, and there was 
a chair uh, that was empty and that chair belonged to to the prime bishop of Poland, uh, Cardinal Wyszyński and people that were gathered uh, during that mass, they were chanting that they want Wyszyński free. So another example that they hope that those changes that that they can observe, they are very deep and profound. And, and if the desire to change the system uh, is expressed in, uh, loudly, uh, then those, those uh, changes uh, might uh, in fact occur. So uh, I think that uh, from a so sociological point of view, uh, that combination of fear and hope uh, was something that uh, was known was was not uh, uh, let's say predicted uh, by the communist elites and and I think that um, that was this this factor especially in Poland that um, that uh, pushed um, the revolution because some people. Um, understood that events uh, within the term of revolution beyond the limits that were uh, that were sketched by the by the communist party and and all those events all those processes that we are talking about uh, they were not taking place in the void because um, let's say very uh, um, let's say that. Uh, there were there were other countries uh, that were ob observing what is happening uh, beyond the iron iron curtain and and my question is uh, what was the um, let's say Western stance uh, on those processes what what was the opinion uh, of the United States that at that time were the country that was, I would say, um, at the first place, which was interested uh, how the situation in the Soviet Union and and in the Eastern Bloc uh, is developing. Um, what can we say about U.S. Uh, U.S. opinions, U.S. stance on that on that process? Uh, if I if I may, and you know, I don't know I don't know all that much about it because I haven't uh, studied this question in detail. Uh, obviously, a longer term strategy of the United States was to um, was peaceful evolution of communism, um, which was pursued by um, uh, by successive American administrations, and then in in, in involved in element of, of, of subversion, I suppose, or, you know, an action or, for example, being beaming broadcasts into Eastern Europe and the hope that this that the people would would, would uh, eventually come to recognize um, uh, the importance of change. And, and that continued throughout 1956. And of course, the whole idea of publishing secret speech, which really uh, uh, accelerated change in, uh, in the in the Soviet bloc uh, came uh, from from the um, uh, from the Eisenhower administration we I think if I'm not mistaken and and uh, and, and you know Bartol may feel free to correct me on this but uh, I believe that the copy of the secret speech was picked up by CIA in Poland in Warsaw and then it yes. somehow decision from was the marketplace from, from the, the marketplace. marketplace exactly from the marketplace which is kind of funny you know how did they how did it end up in the marketplace and i guess uh you know the polish marketplaces were good for this kind of thing but um uh anyway so then the decision had to be made whether or not to publish that and i i remember i was recently reading uh gaddis's biography and his uh, gaddis's biography of canon and 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 you know Gatt uh, john louis gaddis talks about canon and how canon actually was asked his opinion about whether or not to publish the secret speech and he co uh, he warned against it he said don't do this and uh, it was sort of published against his advice as it were uh but uh, he later recognized his mistake he was much too cautious he he did not 
not, you know, he didn't know what the Soviet reaction might be, but it turned out that it spurred this whole considerable change. So this is one side of this. The Americans were obviously looking for change. They were encouraging change. Uh, this is this was whole, you know, this was a part of the long term strategy that was uh, uh, that developed with the beginning of the Cold War. At another level, though, and, and this is where it becomes a little bit more controversial. Uh, it's well known as well that the United States, during the events in Hungary, and here I would uh, uh, I would uh, defer to uh, uh, to Zhuzhan on this, but during the events in Hungary, uh, there was uh, uh, American broadcasts were beaming support for the Hungarian revolutionaries, and when push came to shove, when the Soviets were effectively invading Budapest it turned out that the Americans actually were not willing to offer this practical support. So they were kind of giving psychological support, yeah, you know, cheering them on. Uh, but it turned out that in practical terms, Eisenhower was not willing to risk an actual confrontation with the Soviet Union over Hungary, which was basically assigned, as far as the United States was concerned, to the Soviet sphere of influence. So whatever happened there didn't really matter all that much to Eisenhower, especially that he was busy at the, at the very same time with another crisis that was unfolding within the Western Alliance. That is to say, the Suez crisis where the British and the French and the Israelis were just helping themselves. I mean, they were invading uh, Egypt at the time, right? So Eisenhower had his hands uh, full with that crisis and obviously didn't want to worry too much about what was happening in Budapest. So so what, what that, you know, what that shows is is that by the mid fifties? I mean, really, not even before fifty. I don't know when this. Uh, it's it's hard to say when the Americans decided that essentially what was happening in the Soviet sphere of influence was Soviet what was was Soviet business. When they assigned those Eastern European countries or Central European countries to the Soviet sphere of influence. I mean, we can have a debate about this and disagree or agree on this question, but it's pretty clear that that in nineteen you know nineteen fifty six demonstrated that Hungary could not count on the United States to, to, to rescue it from the clutches of Soviet imperialism. And then, of course, later, 1968, demonstrated it once again, nor could Czechoslovakia count on it, right? So, uh, yeah, uh, so I think they, they could just count on themselves. That's what, you know, that's, that, that's the big, uh, big message here. Yeah, just to continue, uh, Professor Chenko's uh, um, explanations, yeah. Uh, as uh, the researchers uh, had the chance to study the, the um, decisions of the National Security Council of US, now we know uh, much more about uh, what was uh, 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 in the background going. So in, in July of 1956, uh, they, they had a... Uh, they made a um, decision which uh, openly accepted uh, that the detente is and the European status quo is the most important for the United States. And uh, if uh, something happens uh, within the satellite states, uh, they just uh, support, uh, uh, the, let's say, the national communist version of uh, national uh, Communist version of this uh, socialist rule. So, for them, for example, the problem solving what uh, what uh, Gomulka meant in Poland it was just perfect because uh, uh, it, without Soviet tanks uh, uh, they found a acceptable solution. Gomulka was acceptable for the. As, as, as uh, we think in Hungary, but please correct me if it's uh, not uh, uh, perfectly true. So Gomulka was uh, such a figure which uh, uh, could be accept uh, accepted by the Polish people and was he was trustworthy enough for the Soviets. And for example, the Hungarians hoped that uh, uh, the Soviet Union will agree and such a, a, a problem solving and an Imre Nagy could be a Hungarian Gomulka. But of course, uh, it was not a, uh, not a, a story, but uh, uh, really, uh, I, I do agree 
fully with Professor Ochenko that uh, the U.S. Uh, propaganda and uh, real uh, great power interests were totally different. And of course, not only after the suppression of the hunger revolution, not only uh, Soviet Union uh, lost uh, lots of his previous prestige, but also United States, because it became clear that he was not uh, in hurry to save the Hungarians and uh, help them. As the Radio Free Europe uh, uh, advertised during the first half of the 50s. There is a one, I think, uh, very funny factor that uh, all those regimes uh, that uh, were the result of the ev evolution of the uh, processes from the 1956, uh, basically they were uh, some sort of um, versions of national communists. And uh, on the one hand, they were perceived uh, in the United States as a factor that might be used against the Soviets, that the that Soviets no longer control uh, countries in the Eastern Central Europe uh, as they previously did. And, and the funny thing that, uh, that I mentioned is that uh, it was also uh, some sort of perception um, given by the Chinese because for the Chinese, Gomuka was, uh, as a, let's say, internal ruler of Poland, uh, he was a Marxist revisionist because he, uh, for example, condemned collectivization. But uh, when they uh, looked at Gomuka as an international factor, Gomuka might be used as that kind of national communist against the Soviets. Uh, of course, those hopes were not exactly uh, met in re reality because uh, Gomuka's policy uh, was, of course, he was not uh, that kind of, let's say, lenient uh, with the Soviets as Bierut and his, and his team. But on the other hand, uh, from a ge geopolitical point of view, um, he agreed with the policy of the Soviet Union, for example, the invasion on Czechoslovakia. Gomułka was one of the main supporters of, of the decision that was made in the 1968. So that was obviously um, a case that was that was uh, that was uh, um, very convenient from Soviet. Uh, Geopolitics. What? But um, there's also one factor that I think uh, can be mentioned. Uh, uh, I found during my uh, archival research in Cultura ar Archives in, in Paris, in the archives that were uh, produced by Jerzy Giedroch and his editorial, uh, that he was trying to convince. Uh, uh, the U.S. authorities uh, to rely on the liberal forces uh, within the Communist Party in Poland. He, Giedroch and some of U.S. officials believe that uh, if enough support is, is shown to the liberal communists in Poland, like uh, for the Sabinkowski, Adam Schaff, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then uh, the system might implode uh, from inside because there would be some tensions within the party elites that uh, eventually, eventually will lead uh, to, let's say, an uh, internal explosion of the, of the system. And I think that was also some sort of a new approach uh, toward the communist systems uh, in Europe, because um, of course there, there was a, a friction within the party elites uh, during the Stalinist times, but it was different kind of friction that was uh, after the 1956. And, and, and I think that um, that kind of uh, factor uh, lasted until the very end of the communist regimes uh, 
in our part of the world because when we see, for example, the uh, US policy toward Poland in uh, 1980s, uh, we can also recognize that they were looking for liberal communists within the uh, party apparatus uh, that will conduct necessary changes uh, within the economical and political uh, approach of the, of the Communist Party. So uh, I think that uh, from that point of view, I can ask you the last question and then we will go to the questions from the, from the audience. And my question is, uh, what is the heritage of the 1956? Uh, does it have uh, some sort of long-term effect uh, on the events that took place uh, in the Central Europe in the 60s, 70s, and, and, and 80s. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Susanna okay. first. Can, okay. I, can we go? <laughs> uh, you can go first. No, no, please. After. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, when I am uh, teaching the post-World War uh, Hungarian history, uh, 1956 always uh, a crucial point, and um, I used to um, uh, emphasize that even a suppressed revolution, how far-reaching uh, consequences uh, could have, and uh, I I think. Um, from the 1956 revolutions, uh, many lessons uh, were drawn uh, uh, partly by the Hungarian society, partly by the Hungarian decision makers, the politicians, and also the Soviet leaders drew uh, many lessons from this, uh, from, from this double crisis, uh, and I would refer also to the Polish crisis. And, uh, and uh, I think uh, um, one of the biggest lesson uh, was that that uh, the so-called construction of socialism could not could not be realized all the time uh, with uh, asking uh, uh, sacrifice from people and at the, uh, and uh, um, pushing their living standard and uh, as I mentioned that asking all the time more and more sacrifice. So they learned that somehow they, they had to make a compromise with the society and uh, it, it gave bigger room for maneuver than uh, during the Stalinist. And also I think uh, the, um, and it, it also showed the, for the, decision makers that how the society could uh, organize themselves because uh, the workers councils in Hungary also these national committees it was really a bottom up initiative so this uh, uh, it showed the strength of the society and um, the the politicians learned uh, to 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 tolerate and also to to follow up these bottom-up uh, uh, initiatives uh, which uh, appeared during the revolution. Professor so just, Rodchenko, yeah, yes. Just to add to this, you know, they obviously, the consequences of 56 for Eastern Europe were, were deep and profound and lasting. You can, you can see direct lineage from the uh, Hungarian uprising and its suppression by the Soviets to the uh, events of uh, uh, the late 1980s, uh, uh, liberation of Eastern Europe from Soviet control. It's well known, of course, that uh, current Prime Minister Viktor Orban spoke at the burial of uh, Imre Knight when he was reburied uh, um, uh, in, in um, uh, you know, yeah, obviously, the, at the end of when the period of communism ended in Hungary. And it is kind of ironic, of course, that uh, uh, some further 
30 years on, we find a very different Orban, who is actually sometimes uh, saying things that are at odds with uh, the uh, spirit of freedom and democracy. In fact, well, it's interesting, you know, today, if you think about what, uh, what 1956 means today for Eastern Europe, uh, I, 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 struggle, you know, I struggle to really understand this. Like, for example, a few days ago, uh, the, uh, the Hungarian internal minister of interior, I believe, uh, Judith Varga, made a claim that uh, uh, that the that the European Union is like the USSR, and that uh, back in 1956, Hungarian revolutionaries, you know, fought for their freedom, and today, you know, Hungary is fighting for its freedom. And you just read it, you think, oh my God, you know, what is happening to us? What is happening to history? Other either people no, do not know enough history, or they know history and then they subvert it, or just use it for their political political purposes. So I'm really worried about the memory of 1956 uh, being subverted and uh, uh, been used for something else in Eastern Europe. But nevertheless, you can still see 1956 as the turning point, as I mentioned, for uh, for the communist project, because obviously it, it obviously it showed that you can, you know, communism depends on Soviet military might. If it's if there's nobody there to enforce, people choose something else. It just doesn't work. So that's as far as as far as uh, Europe is concerned. But you have to remember as well that 1956 had a broader resonance for the world. For example, 1956, Bartolomeo mentioned China. Uh, 1956 was met with uh, great concern among the Chinese leadership for good reasons, because Mao Zedong in China thought that he was, well, thought there were clear parallels with Stalin, and he was not happy with Khrushchev's criticism of Stalin, because that kind of undermined Mao Zedong's own authority. Now, Mao Zedong's way of dealing with this was to try to to allow uh, a degree of freedom in the Chinese society. For a while, he tried to do that. This program was called 100 Flowers Program, 100 Flowers Campaign, uh, but it led to people immediately criticizing the Ch Chinese Communist Party because it turned out that once people are given freedom to criticize, they go all the way to the top and they say, you know, we don't like the system, we want to get rid of it. Um, uh, and, and, and so what happened after that is uh, Mao Zedong turned very um, uh, strongly against this and uh, launched the so-called anti-rightist movement, which led to suppression of all forms of dissent in China, a situation that by and large continues to the present day. So uh, 1956 was also a lesson, I guess, for the Chinese leadership. Their solution to the experiences of Hungary and Poland was that you never allow voices of freedom to speak out because once you do, this is an avalanche that you cannot stop and then your regime is finished. And they've learned from that lesson, I think, and they've returned to this lesson in June, 1989. And I think they're uh, quite prepared to enforce this lesson again, if this, uh, if, if, if this is what it, what it comes to, if they need to really hold on to their power. So uh, this is another aspect of 1956. And we have to remember that this really truly was an event of global significance, uh, something that certainly Khrushchev Never could have anticipated when he made that speech on February 25th, 1956. Yes, it's very, I think it's very, very important that what you have said, uh, because I think uh, it's some sort of uh, a lesson for, uh, for a uh, Polish society that uh, after the 1956, that they learned that uh, there is some uh, room for, let's say, negotiations with the communist regime that you can, uh, you know, use to for your for your advantage. That that if you are uh, trying to um, <clears throat> trying to basically push your agenda uh, against the ruling party, then that party has to, uh, let's say, take it under the consideration. And, and that was a very important uh, lesson. And, and it was uh, obviously uh, very true when we speak about the rise of solidarity, when we um, saw that kind of, uh, let's say, um, experience uh, um, implied uh, was once again, but there was, of, but there was of course one difference uh, that in the 19, 1980 uh, workers were organized and the trade union 
uh, was created, uh, something that was uh, lacking in the 1956, because in the 1956, uh, workers uh, still believe that if they are organized within their own uh, um, places of work, like fabrics, and they create uh, workers' uh, councils, then they might have some influence uh, how the system actually looked like. In the 1980s, uh, mm, workers learned that there was no reason to believe that the system can be changed uh, from inside. Uh, and, uh, and also with cooperation with the structures for the that belong to the to the system that there must be a, a creation of some other external structure uh, in that instance uh, a, tr a trade union uh, from which all those social desires are are expressed and and I think that uh, in Polish case uh, this is one of the of one of the most important lessons that is derived from the uh, 1956. Uh, I think that um, now we can go to to the questions from our our audience. So um, let's let's open uh, let's open the discussion. Uh, everyone is welcome to to answer uh, uh, to give questions to our to our guests and to me, of course. Uh, you can type in your uh, questions into the Q and A um, section, or you can uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask them live. Um, okay, I think that there is one question. It's from Miss Ella Grabinska. Um, Ah, okay, and Professor Rodchenko already answered that, okay. <laughs> I'm learning also how to use this chat box. Okay, okay, there is a question from Ms. Lydia Roberts, and the question is, what was the role of Gulag returnees in the, the Stalinization? Uh, I think it's a question for, for Professor Rodchenko. Uh, right. Well, uh, obviously, it depends on what kind of returnees we're talking about. Um, uh, the members of intelligentsia who had been purged and were sent into Gulag, and many of them did not survive, but some of them did survive and then come, you know, would come back, um, were allowed to reintegrate in the society and then. Um, to develop their views and, and, and perhaps influence influence the uh, uh, the society through their writing. Uh, so uh, of course, you know everybody knows the the big names. Um, people like uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn is a, is a is a good example. You know his publication of One Day um, in the Life of Ivan Denisovich uh, was a was a serious. Uh, stepping stone towards gradual relaxation of tensions. Now, this this happened uh, some years later, so not in 1956. Um, I might, you know, maybe 60, 61 or 62. I, I, I now it, it escapes me exactly when it was published. It was all considered and closely debated at the at the uh, presidium of the Soviet Communist Party at the time. And Khrushchev allowed this publication partly because he continued to struggle against the vestiges of Stalinism. And there was a you know for him it was it was in his interest really to continue to promote the thought. And when the um, when the book was published, it was not published as in a book form, but as a sort of series of um, uh, series of um, uh, um, uh, Sections, as it were, in the, uh, in, the, in, the in the in the magazine, it had a a, 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 a very very 
I guess, you know, influential impact on uh, the uh, intelligentsia in Moscow, in Leningrad. People were reading this, people were discussing this. Uh, so in the early 60s, really, where this uh, time when people suddenly felt that they could suddenly talk about all those things that people could only whisper about just a decade before that or, you know, two decades before that. Everyone had been so afraid and now there was a, a feeling of release. They could talk about uh, the... Uh, the horrors that they had experienced. Some of them had experience in the Gulag. Uh, some of them, you know, could now read about those experiences as well. So this this atmosphere of the early 1960s um, from, uh, helped nurture a whole generation of, of, of Soviet citizens, Russian citizens, they even received the name Shistidisetniki, right, people of the 60s, who then um, played, who came to play a very important role later on as they politically matured, as they entered uh, uh, political life, you, you know, you have people like Gorbachev, Mikhail Gorbachev, who was a students at Moscow State University in the 1950s, right? So he sort of partook in this. So he was, his own his own family had people who had been perched in the gulag and had suffered through that, um, uh, through, through the years of Stalinism. And so now people like Gorbachev could read about it, could uh, understand it, could debate this. Uh, so there was a sense of, 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 of freedom that had not been there uh, ever before. And that, of course, led in the 1980s towards a whole different atmosphere, which allowed for perestroika, for glasnost to actually take root. Thank you very much. Uh, and we have an another question. It's from Ms. Ella Grabinska. Uh, what was the reaction of the Polish people, not the party, to the Hungarian Revolution? Uh, I think that I will ans answer that question. Uh, it's a, I think, uh, great topic to be to be covered because um, we can we can uh, say that the Hungarian Revolution was um, was very very important for the Polish people, uh, for uh, for example, ordinary people uh, were giving their blood uh, actually uh, to the. Uh, to the Hungarian people that were uh, that were uh, that were wounded during the the Hungarian up uprising, and and it was a massive uh, mm, massive process in, in Poland, in, and in many cities there were special points open for the people to give them the blood, and that blood was was sent uh, to Hungary to to help all those people that were that were wounded during the revolution uh, but but also hungarian revolution was very important for uh intellectuals who were um previously involved in the stalinist uh, system and and uh, there comes to my mind an example of viktor voroshilsky who was a who was a writer uh, a supporter of of Stalinist movement uh, in the Polish uh, in the Polish literary world during, uh, during the Stalinist period, and uh, during the fall, uh, um, he changed his views. But it but it was not a change that uh, that were that was caused. Uh, I don't know by his opportunism or something like that. No, he was really shocked uh, by the practices of, of uh, Stalinism. And in the autumn of 1956, uh, he went to Budapest and he was a correspondent of Polish newspaper and he was covering the topic. And when he returned to Poland um, in November 1956, uh, he described everything he saw uh, on his own eyes to his friends uh, from intellectual uh, circles in Warsaw. And the way the Soviets treated the Hungarians, the way uh, the Soviet army conducted, uh, conducted its operation in Hungary, it was, uh, I would say, the last shock for the Polish intellectuals uh, that previously were some that previously we were supporting uh, uh, the communist authorities in Poland, uh, 
and that shock uh, was uh, a re reason why, um, let's say, majority of Polish intelligentsia after the 1956 was very critical towards the communist system in, in, in Poland. So basically the impact of Hungarian revolution uh, in Poland was very huge, very important. And, uh, and uh, was uh, met with the great interest uh, uh, from the Polish society. Um, we have another question, and the question is from Mr. John Kapustka, and uh, it is, how is the destalinization view in the current political climate and discourse in Poland? Um, I think that there are not uh, discussions that covered that covered the topic uh, of the 1956, but I think uh, it's it's not a, a a cause that that is strictly connected uh, with contemporary uh, <laughs> situation in Poland. It's connected uh, how the 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 Stalinization, the the fall and the changes from 1956 were uh, um, perceived. Uh, I would say after 1988, because. There were in the Polish uh, calendar, I would say, the calendar of the Polish resistance against the communist regime, uh, more important uh, events like creation of solidarity, like the like the protests uh, in 1970 um, in Gdańsk and other cities uh, near the Baltic Sea, where the workers were massacred uh, by the soldiers that were sent by the Communist Party. So, so uh, in that regard, the events of 1956, the, the Stalinization and, and all those events, they were obscured. And, and I think that this process, unfortunately, uh, is is currently is is currently lasting and 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 personally I think it's a pity because 1956 um, was a very important experience for for the Polish society and and also uh, it's an example that even after the years of oppression uh, there is uh, some spark within the people that receive that kind of that kind of oppression, that spark that might ignite and lead them uh, to achieve uh, some tremendous and and important and and important ideas. So, so yeah, I think that uh, in a nutshell, 1956 uh, is some sort of a victim uh, of the other important events. Uh, in the uh, history of, of Poland during the communism. Um, I don't think we have received any other questions. Uh, please, you're welcome. You can uh, write in our Q&A section and you can ask it by unmuting yourself. Mm. Okay, since we haven't received any new question. Oh, okay, no, there is something. I do have, well, I, I see one question at the top. Um, at the uh, very top. Do you see that? Where is it? At the very top. It's in q and Ah, yeah, there is, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't scroll up and, okay. Uh, it's a question from Dr., uh, from Mr. Timothy Klaus, and um, it's what did people in Poland and Hungary see that people in other Warsaw Pact countries did not see relative to the destalinization? 
I think what I think this question. I mean, it's a very interesting question, uh, but one one has to remember that uh, that Poland and Hungary, of course, had profound, very important events. But 1956 had impact on every uh, country of of the communist bloc. Um, uh, for example, you know, just to give you one total random example that people don't necessarily think about, 1956 had a huge impact on North Korea. In so much so that in North Korea there was an attempt to overthrow Kim Il Sung by his detractors. They organized the uh, you know what would be coup against him or you know party uh, kind of movement on him uh, that was ultimately unsuccessful because he outmaneuvered them and then he had them purged uh, in and that uh, you know but that's one example of destalinization affecting a country as far away as North Korea. Uh, sadly, in North Korea, Kim Il Sung's triumph in the in 1956 meant that Korea remained a hideous communist dictatorship until the present day, um, uh, with uh, his son and later grandson running the show. But uh, in other countries like Mongolia, for example, there was a form of destalinization in Mongolia with people speaking out against uh, abuses of the past and uh, 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 talking about their national national culture and uh, you know how the Mongolia should not follow just you know be slavish follower of the Soviet Union there was uh, impact of of um, you know in 1956 had its impact on on Germany on East Germany of course um, on Bulgaria um, uh, Romania was probably a slightly different case, and of course, Albania was a, a, a very different case. Now, in Albania, once again, similar to North Korea, perhaps, there was again a movement against Denver Hosha, the leader of, of, of Albanian uh, ruling party, and he moved against this or outmaneuvered those people. And... Um, ultimately prevailed and Albania then remained a, a communist dictatorship. So the question is here, you know, there was movement everywhere. There were movement of uh, the intelligentsia, there were, there were, there was different protest uh, of different extent, depending on the country, of course, but it's certainly every country of the Warsaw Pact and beyond the Warsaw Pact, the broader socialist commonwealth was affected by, by 1956. Um, so that would be my answer to this question. Thank you very much. And, and I don't see any other uh, questions. Mm. Okay, since there are not new questions, I think that we might uh, conclude our conversation, our panel. Thank you very much for being with us uh, this lovely evening. Uh, I'm very excited that, that we had that conversation on the panel and I look forward for uh, our next panels and, and also um, to conduct uh, a new uh, conversations that, that will in include uh, Dr. Varga and Professor Radchenko. So, have a nice evening, have a nice day, uh, day and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you, Bartek. Yes, thank you. To next Bye. time. Bye. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for organizing this interesting discussion and moderating. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.